name is Brown, and I am a literacy and family learning specialist here in CFL. Um, can everybody see the screen okay? Yes. Well, we will get started. Um, we are a small group today, so as we go through, we're going to cover a lot of information. Uh, if you have questions, we will be monitoring the chat, uh, or feel free to just call out uh, your questions as we go through. Up here we have a list of our Toyota Family Learning team. Uh, in the room with me right now, we have uh, Emily Sedgwick, Brittany, uh, Brenda Logan, and Trisha Lovett. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. We will be recording this to put on the Wikispace later, so if there were others at your organization that couldn't join, um, you'll be able to share this with them as well. Just a list of the organizations that are included in the grant. I think we have uh, Dorcas International Institute of Rhode Island on the phone with us today, um, cohort one, and uh, two organizations are listed here. And to be doing, someone was asking a question there. Today we'll just be doing a very brief overview of um, kind of the whole program. So we may move somewhat quickly. If we move too fast, uh, don't hesitate to let us know. So start, um, one important aspect of Toyota Family Learning that's very new to this program is look at a technology integration. Um, and very important to that is considering digital citizenship. Um, when we think digital citizenship, uh, certainly digital access is typically um, kind of the first major hurdle to address. I know a lot of programs have started investing in iPads or other um, devices to have available for families. Um, so a great way to get started because obviously access is um, kind of the first place that has to be available for uh, participants. Digital commerce, typically it's not as major of a focus in the program. Uh, but some programs have worked with families on signing up for affordable health care and uh, other particulars of when they get family service learning projects, looking at how to secure uh, donations and resources. Digital uh, kind of infuses a lot of programming, particularly communicating with the participants outside of the programming time. Lots of those extra little um, communications can be very helpful to make sure that families you've recruited are retained in the program. Um, move to literacy. Resources are available to help, and uh, certainly your technical assistant can help with um, ways to increase families' understanding of how to use technology and um, what really is available to them. Digital kit follows to help understand what's appropriate when they're uh, interacting in the digital space. Uh, into digital law, that certainly is important to us. Um, I know sites are very diligent about getting um, photo consents so that we're sure that when we're sharing uh, photos, when we're tweeting out what's going on at your sites, that um, we're paying attention to law and rights and responsibilities. Um, Digital health and wellness certainly comes up often with uh, because um, we talk about screen time. And so that may be something that parents are particularly concerned with in your program. Um, so that's certainly good to keep in mind. Uh, at digital security. I think somebody may be, uh, if you guys can phone as you're listening. I think we're getting a little rever reverberation from someone. Okay, civil security then um, we're also helping families to understand about um, what happens whenever they are in a digital space. Sometimes it's very easy to, to understand the full uh, of what they 
your your invitation is doing. If you're sharing pictures on Facebook, as, if they're set to private, then anybody can see those. So helping everyone to, um, to understand what what it looks like when they're sharing things online. Um, just um, if if you're kind of newer to the program. Just as a background on me, I am our English language learner specialist. Um, so I always like to call attention to the title of this particular um, area. So digital citizenship is a more technical term. Um, you feel that that's a phrase that is not welcome for families you work with? Absolutely feel free to just talk to them about, you know, appropriate use of technology. Um, we all the distance of a digital space, but um, we also have to accept the reality that sometimes that word citizenship can um, bring concerns for one. Advancing, I apologize. why it's not letting me show you, but we can certainly go right on to um, looking at the theory of change without it. So hopefully you can see my mail, which is not what was supposed to happen there. I apologize. A um, little bit of difficulty there. Uh, maybe if we just go back to looking at the PowerPoint together. Um, We'll face in just a moment. Uh, so, really, what family learning is based on a theory of change that uh, compounds throughout the communities in which um, it, is, it is already happening. So, we'll do the theory of change here because you'll look more closely at each of the cornerstones in a moment. The change begins with parents kind of serving themselves by um, learning more and uh, learn how to be better for parents for their children. Um, this is parent time and is already happening across the 10 organizations. Parents use what they're learning to have better interactions, um, more infused more learning and interactions with their children in parent and child together or packed time. Uh, mentoring gives families the opportunity to work together with families um, to share the things that they've learned so that they each become stronger. And family service learning uh, really so far has been kind of the, the excitement draw for most organizations. Um, families are really sharing what they're doing together and um, moving it further into their community. So it also um, goes very closely with the theory of change, and you can find it on the wiki space. Um, I will that one more time here and see if maybe it's deciding to be a little more um, helpful. There we go. Maybe. So this is the Toya Family Learning Wiki space. I know for some of you this may be the first time that you're seeing it. Uh, this is kind of the repository of, of resources, information, evaluation uh, tools that, that will strengthen and um, support Toyota Family Learning. If you're working in a program and you do not have access to this Wiki space yet, um, at the end, hang around and, and we can talk about how to get you access. Or uh, you could send an email to Emily Sedgwick, which is E S E D G W I C K at emilyslearning.org, and um, she can help you out with that also. But look at the wiki space. Um, the page at the beginning shows the theory of change again. and um, you can click directly into the theory of change. Where's um, a nice video that just kind of talks about 
why is it to build adult capacity when we're looking to improve uh, lives of children? And uh, so we won't watch the video now just because it's a little lengthy, but it's a good video to check out and uh, share across your staff. So look at 21st century skills. I'll give you just a second in case anybody has any questions. So good. Um, 21st century skills is certainly something that we um, we want to infuse throughout programming with families. Uh, we look at strengthening communication, collaboration, uh, critical thinking, creativity, and innovation, um, problem solving. Uh, these kind of are infused throughout all of what you do with families. Uh, certainly looking at collaboration and problem solving, creativity. Um, I think a lot of that is what makes family service learning so exciting to many of the organizations. Um, it gives families a chance to, opt to interact in ways that they um, maybe are not so used to. Um, what else is important about that is that those are the kinds of skills that are preparing families not only to work better together, but to um, increase their opportunities for uh, success in school, for children, uh, for parents as well, but also uh, looking at making opportunities for employment as well. So additional um, skills we look at with 21st century skills, uh, leadership has been a major factor that a lot of parents have uh, noted as they talk about the um, participating in family service learning, that they're really learning how to take a bigger role in the, the process that their groups are developing. So moving from that preparing people for, uh, for greater opportunities, we also want to help family understand as they're participating in this program, um, they can increase connections to, to actually realize success in those, um, those new skills that they have. Um, it's great to have the skills to be able to do a, a job that's a better paying job, but um, as we look at helping families to build social capital, they start to understand how important it is to make relationships in their community, in the organizations they're working with, um, they can be actualized into um, to really finding those opportunities to put their new skills to use. Um, social capital and help families to understand how to take what they're learning, how they can make connections with other people, and actually leverage that to improve their family's quality of life. Infuse, uh, should be infused throughout the program. Um, that has the potential to be developed um, between families as a part of family mentoring, um, and certainly should be included as your as your training families to be mentors. They should um, be understanding how it is that they can help each other to develop social capital more. Um, also, through family service learning. We'll talk about that in a moment, but very often it's, um, it's easy as the program staff member to want to help parents out as much as possible when developing these projects, but um, that's really where the benefit of being a little more hands-off and giving them the power to, to develop the projects, to seek out resources, uh, to, to go and approach people to come and check out the project. Uh, local government officials, reaching out to media, um, that and the families the opportunity to develop their social capital. When we think about how, we, um, how we've gone to the positions that we're in in life, um, finishing college for, for most of us, uh, having the current employment position that you have, those, those types of um, opportunities in our lives are a direct result of knowing how to leverage our social capital, knowing how to use the connections that we have with other people 
for our benefit. Um, and then it's easy to kind of overlook that some families, especially new arrival families, um, families who have been transient or simply came from a different area, um, it can be difficult to understand how to take that social capital, um, build up, and then actually to use that to their benefit. the capacity that the families have. Toyota Family Learning um, certainly looks to build from the assets that families do have. So um, we want to think about where they're starting so that we can raise them up. There are certain different reasons for varying levels of capacity among families. Um, the choices that we make the choices that we don't make and something just random in the universe happens to us um, can create or take away opportunities uh, to develop capacity within ourselves and within our families. Um, so it's important to understand that families don't necessarily start out at the same place, but we, um, we can work with them from where they are. We look to do that. The highest common good depends on everyone reaching their full potential. Uh, this is one reason why that collaboration is so important as a part of Toyota Family Learning. Family working together so that everyone is stronger, and then in thinking about how that moves out into the community so that the entire community is stronger because your organization is bringing Toyota Family Learning there. An opportunity of compounding change. I look at taking family learning, which is intergenerational, pulling both generations together, not just working with the parents because it's a little easier to schedule, but reeling in both generations together, deliberately setting up, up opportunities, starting where families are at and looking at their assets. As we pull these, these different components together, we have the opportunity to make exponential change. Uh, that will last through generations of these families. Looking at, at all of that kind of brings us to breaking down the cornerstones of the program then. Parent time. Uh, parent time is a regularly scheduled time, uh, a minimum of two hours a week. And this is time where you're going to share the new ideas and information with parents. And as before, um, we want parents to guide this time. We want for support to the parents, um, connect to their needs, and help help the parents set goals for themselves and their families. So parent time is really a time to discuss topics that the parents are interested in. Um, this could also include this could also include bringing in guest speakers, um, and a time to prepare parents to work with their children. So talk to them about strategies. Uh, activities that they might be able to do um, with their children. So we're looking really here at a gradual release. So as your program started, you may be planning um, the majority of, of the first couple of parent times, but as you go through the program, the parents should be guiding this experience. So it is all based on what the parents need uh, and, and what topics are coming up as you move through parent time. We do uh, on our wiki space, and we will take you, as we go through these cornerstones, we will take you in and out of the wiki space just to make you aware of what all is on there. Um, but there's a sample parent time format here, and we'll also show you where that is on the, on the wiki. On the left side of the screen, you'll see all of the cornerstones. So as you click on parent time, um, there is a background knowledge document that gives you a little bit more than what I'm telling you right now, but um, some general background knowledge. You'll also see four sample lesson plans. Uh, we have some on Family Time Machine, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, uh, Family Time Kit, and then there's just an example of a single session. Um, there's also a video there for you to use as a resource. 
I mentioned that there is a chat here at the bottom, so there is a discussion board on each of these. So this is a place where you can share information, um, post any questions that you might have that you want to get feedback from the group. So this can be a resource um, for us all to, to share with each other. That, do we have questions about parent time before we move on to tax time? Um, we have a question about uh, building capacity. Sure. Um, I, I don't know you covered this a little bit after I wrote it down, but, but I don't know what the parent's level of capacity is. I mean, sometimes they don't know. That really comes from getting to know the parents. It means that at the beginning of programming, um, it takes a little bit of time to to, to know parents, to explore the um, the different kinds of skills that they that would have already and that they would need to develop. Um, we will look at the um, when we family mentoring. We'll look at the family mentoring facilitator guide. Uh, and the resources section there does include um, kind of a strength survey for families. Okay, yeah. Um, That's, mm. tools, tools such as that will help you to, to start to explore that a little more with families. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you're exactly right. Sometimes people don't really know what they don't know, and so it takes, it takes some time of really getting to know the families you're working with. Right. Well, the other thing um, is you have to be careful not to make any assumptions yourself, right? Because it might, oh, this you know person isn't is educated, or maybe they this you know situation, or they haven't had this experience, and yet they may have obvious capacities that I don't have, or you know things that I don't even know about. But uh, whatever you said made that. that very clear to me because I was thinking, oh gosh, yeah, I, I've had college and I've had all these experiences, but yet they have things, you know, that right. I mean, I learned some of that from a, a like a poverty class, you know, when you're learning about the strengths that we each have. But you look that over. Thank you. Uh, and certainly, that's a good point you make. Um, you know, a lot of times it's easy to kind of overlook the some of the very particular assets that families in the programs have. But mm -hmm. when you look at resourcefulness or yeah, um that's high on the know, scale. Mm -hmm. Find ways because if you're if you're living in a situation where um where your family maybe doesn't have enough money to mm -hmm. to meet things beyond basic needs or even basic needs, um your resourcefulness typically kind of increases significantly as you learn to navigate that type of um, situation. Well, it's helpful to know, to point this out to them as well, because mm -hmm. some of our parents might think, well, I don't have anything to offer. They're intimidated, but I think as you try to help point that out, that's going to help build their confidence. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think sometimes it can be helpful to start once and then move into needs a little more as you as you get to know the families better. So you might start also by even just using a survey to ask parents what they think they would like to learn about. Mm -hmm. uh, something that their children are specifically struggling with or that, you know, if you have them think of the times when they get the most frustrated with their children, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that can lead to very good discussions of, um, skill that would be helpful for them to develop. Got idea. Well, thank you very much. No problem. I'll and meet, I guess. Here you go. Okay. Are there before we move on? Okay, we'll go to pack time. Pack time should also be a regularly scheduled time. This is a minimum of two hours per week. Um, this can happen in many different places. This could be happening uh, center-based or school-based. It can be happening in the home, uh, also out in the community as we look into, um, you know, service learning and family mentoring. Uh, it's a time where parents can practice what they've learned in parent time and a time for real parent-child interaction. 
action. So parents are not just observing their children, um, we're volunteering in their child's program, um, we're really wanting them to interact and practice what they've learned in parent time. So they're an active participant in what their child is doing. Uh, as we look at this process, uh, whether your parents are going to be doing this uh, or your families in the home or in, in, in schools or out in the community, um, something to think about is really how they will be documenting this time. Because they come back to parent time, we're going to ask them to fill out a log that discusses, it goes over everything that they've done with their children um, for pack time. So I know that some places are giving parents binders that have um, sheets in there where they can document uh, what they're doing for pack time. Um, some others have mentioned um, creating journals for families, but thinking of a way that's meaningful for your families. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same for everyone, but thinking about how parents can document what they're doing while it's happening so that when you come back um, to debrief with them that they're able to have some good discussion about what they did and they're able to remember everything done with their children. This is all to talk about parent interactions. So helping parents to see um, how they can be actively engaged with their child. So this might look um, different depending on the environment. So if they're coming into the classroom, talking to them about what that looks like, um, what's happening in the classroom, and how they can join with their child, um, and so the child's lead and really. Um, get to that, that child's level and interact uh, with the child. The students, so some of this will happen um, during parent time. So when we look at the first step when we're planning, um, some of this is happening during time where you're working on strategies or suggestions for things that they can do with their children. Um, so they're planning and preparing for this um, before it happens so that they're intentional about what is happening uh, during tax time. During their experience, they'll want to, to find a way to document. This could also be um, taking pictures. Um, or doing any of those types of things with, um, with their child as they're going through. Um, so that they can come back and debrief. So the debriefing step is going to happen um, during parent time. So when they come back to their next parent time session, uh, you want to dedicate some time to debrief that experience. So parents share what they've done with their children. Um, they can share ideas and can also ask any questions. If they had something, you know, uh, we were working on homework really struggled with you know, finding resources from you or maybe from other parents who've had similar experiences. We want to sure that they have that time to, to deep what they've done with their children um, and also help them see how what they're doing can transfer um, into all of those areas, into the home, school, and community. So we partially through pack time in action, and this includes uh, elementary campus learning, uh, also the family time machine and family time kit. So every uh, family time kit, um, every family should have one at some point. I know that everyone's using them a little bit differently. Uh, if you haven't already had a chance to look through these, um, it would be something to ask uh, to take a look at. Uh, it's basically um, activities aired by the family time machine that families can do at home offline. So um, there are lots of, of neat activities in there to inspire families to, uh, to do things together. And we're all taking you to the website to familytimemachine.com. But I'll pause quickly in case anyone has any questions. I thought of someone to speak, but maybe not. We'll move to Family Time Machine. Um, Patricia has the controls, so you okay with walking them through that quickly? <laughs> sure. So um, Family Time Machine, as uh, Andrea mentioned earlier, there are two parent time lesson plans available to help you introduce this to families. Um, an expectation of Toyota Family Learning is that every participating family registers for an account on the Family Time Machine and regularly interacts with the site. Um, we love to see activities posted by families. 
In fact, uh, currently in development, there is a kind of a worksheet to help you guide families through planning and activities. If they'd like to submit one. Um, it's not a pressure point that you that you have to put on families. So, if they are not to a point where they would feel comfortable sharing, they're still absolutely welcome to register for an account and to interact with activities that are available. Um, and there, the first time that you log on, I'm a frequenter of the Family Time Machine, so um, score does not show up for me, but the first time you log on to the Family Time Machine, there's that little tour that will uh, take you around. You can all re-access that. Um, I guess I can show uh, It will just take you, just like any, uh, any website tour, it will take you around to show you different parts of the site. Um, that can be a helpful way to kind of start families on the path of, of understanding how these work. Um, there are activities available. You simply click the title of the activity and it will appear um, so that you can see what other families have done and uh, do your activities as well. Um, one thing to note about the actual activities. If the activity is denoted with a star, that it was submitted by a family. If it have that star, that means that was a an originally seated activity for the family time machine. Um, those activities tend to be a little bit longer if they were original to the site. They also feature just above the click to see more. Uh, they feature a conditional prompt that explains to parents what their children are learning or what they as a family are, are developing by doing this activity. When you click to see more, uh, there will always be a connection to a wonder on Wonderopolis and uh, kind of an extension activity that families can do. Um, I also just want to point out, because this is a very exciting uh, new development on the Family Time Machine, we do actually have some activities available in Espanol now. Um, so we've been very excited to to see those start coming in. Um, these are actually submitting them in Spanish. Um, we had a comment on another family's uh, activity the other day in Spanish, which was, uh, that was very exciting. Um, so that is happening on the site, and that's absolutely um, fine for families to do. But I said um, to make it a little easier in that transition to really submitting things in an online um, format, we are working on just a little guide for um, program staff and then taking that to the current level of how to plan an activity to submit to the Family Time Machine, uh, just to make sure that they, um, they're planned out and um, parents wouldn't and then back then needing to, to add a little more. Um, are there questions about Family Time Machine? Okay. Then with, we will look at the other uh, ways that we see PAC time in action. Um, first is service learning, which really has been um, as I said, kind of the the big statement for most organizations. Uh, this is kind of where there's an opportunity to reach out to your community and show what families are doing um, to give families the opportunity to build social capital and build their capacity. Um, so looking at service learning, it's very important to remember that it is it is service, it is doing something to help the community, but it's also a way to integrate um, academic outcomes or educational outcomes. That can be tied to what parents are doing in parent time. Um, so we have some traditional four component um, callers line as well. If uh, parents are in adult education, certainly tying what they're learning in class to the outcomes of the service learning project um, is a great way to, to build out and make it more concrete for them. 
and then what children are learning. Um, that's definitely something that uh, that you may be interested in as parent time sessions to look at how to take what, what I know my child is learning in, in school and as we're working on service learning together, how to help them to, to practice those skills. Because really where where you're to get the, the big benefit. It feels nice for everyone, and it's nice to be able to share what's going on for the service part of service learning. But really, the integrating parts of the curriculum, integrating um, real learning in process is um, incredibly valuable. And um, part of that also looks at really making sure that participants know how to be reflective. Um, even really program staff guiding participants through reflecting on what they're doing. So, they, so they're understanding what they're learning and they're connecting that to what they're doing as service. <laughs> the process. Um, also development is, and this is early development, so it may still be a little bit before it's released, but a um, facilitator guide to help um, help programs walk families through the process of family service learning a little more easily and just kind of pulling in those um, those basic outcomes. So look at the process. We begin investigation. Um, this can be done with families all together. I think some uh, organizations did that as part of the family version. Um, also, in some programs, I've seen that families will uh, do kind of a tour of their city together at, as a pack time activity, you know, individual families, and then come back and debrief that together um, to help determine not only um, what the challenges in the community are, but also to help appreciate the strengths. Just as we talked about with building capacity, that sometimes there are strengths there we don't we don't think about. Families. Um, it happens with communities and some service learning projects um, tend to focus on looking for what is good in the community and helping people to, to realize and celebrate that as well. Um, so we move an investigation to planning and uh, preparing the project, uh, thinking through their, what, what will be necessary to carry out this project. Um, and to that, there's actually a, a guide available on the wiki base. Um, it is the guide for um, panic. Sorry, it has to come up here. Uh, this is based around the idea of smart goals. Um, I know Andrea mentioned helping families to set goals as part of parent time and also part of just the program as a larger whole. Uh, so we pulled the SMART uh, goals framework in to look at what families need to consider as they are planning a project. Um, this can certainly be adapted. There may be things that families um, got in particular in your community. Um, so to make that a little clear for you, there is also an editable Word version. Um, also, while we're looking on the service learning page, there are um, mentions about each of the steps of family service learning and how that could be um, present parents and, um, and practiced with their children. Uh, also, a video that's not particularly family service learning, but it does highlight the steps and um, to me it gives an idea of um, how really different age groups can be pulled into one project together to make it meaningful for everyone. So um, hopefully the SMART Goals framework will help with your uh, planning though with families. Um, the planning and preparation step for many organizations um, has been noted to be really longer step. Um, 
it's when police go to actually do the project, they should feel completely prepared, have made contact with anyone that they um, that would help from to get resources that they're going to need. So they come to the next step of action, everyone's prepared for that action to happen. Action, of course, is just doing the, uh, the service. It is um, typically not the longest part of the process. Because very often, if families have done a really good job of investigating and planning and preparing, um, action becomes really supposed to be. It's just one step in the process. Um, as through each of these steps, and certainly as they're coming to a close in the project, families should reflect on what they what they're doing in their community and what they're learning from that. With this project. This typically would be seen in, in, in that same kind of way as um, more of a gradual release, where the first project, as a parent facilitator, probably will help families and guide them through the entire process, which is certainly true of the reflection step. Um, if you ever told parents to uh, check with their children to see if they understand when they read a story or when they listen to a story, um, and they, okay, did you understand that story? Uh, you kind of understand why it's important for uh, parents to have guidance with reflection. It's not just as simple as, you know, thinking for a couple of minutes about what they're doing. It's really having the opportunity to discuss how this is important in their life. What connections are they making? What did they learn academically? And what did they learn as far as life skills? Did they learn to write letters to request um, resources? Did they learn to uh, take picture, document what they're doing? So families an opportunity and strong guidance to reflect on what they're doing is critical to um, to really cementing what it is that they're learning. Um, reflection can be and should be infused throughout the process. But it still leads to a demonstration and celebration. For some projects, the demonstration and celebration is, um, you know, just within the group, and it may be at your organization. For some projects, though, um, those are real great ways to show local officials, um, community, people in the school where the uh, children attend exactly what they're doing. And so celebrations can be very large, and uh, certainly we encourage you to invite any applicable um, government officials or media, uh, because that really leads to a stronger program and um, also the last step here of sustainability. Sustainability is looking at this not only the project that families are developing at this time, but also looking at how do we sustain family service learning as a practice that families do on, on a repeating basis? And also, how does that become sustainable within your organization? Uh, the more that others in the community are seeing what these service learning projects create and do for families, the chances of being able to sustain those, uh, those projects because others will want to be involved and to help celebrate what families are doing. Are there any service learning? Uh, I have another question, but I want to give anyone else the opportunity. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead. Okay, so I have a question. I guess, um, so when it comes to the, the service learning, is the plan, um, um, both the parent and the child engaged in doing the planning, or is it the parents mainly are focused on planning it out? Say, definitely we want to see both as much as possible. Um, that depends, that as much as possible depends on families you're working with. Um, if programs who are working primarily with children uh, at the early childhood level, uh, there may be a lot more of 
kind of setting up the steps as as part of parent time, but then half time extension of that being that parents work with their children to actually plan. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. And that is something that you could certainly talk to your um, technical assistant about more. Um, so there's more clarity needed there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. My question is, um, you know, early stages of, you know, this program. So, mm -hmm. you know, it may just be early, but. What you're describing, I'm wondering, is everyone else experiencing this level of engagement? Uh, I don't see that really happening. Uh, people seem more hesitant, and um, uh, you know, at this point, I don't thought like, oh yeah, we're going to go out and do all these things, and we're ready to go. And I mean, how like how long does it take? Till they get that engaged? Is there things we can do to promote that kind of level of engagement? I mean, do you um, understand? I think I understand what you're asking. Um, I would say a lot of the excitement that I hear when I'm talking with different organizations, um, and they tell me which projects families are really excited to start up on. Mm -hmm. A lot of that really seems to come from the investigation stage. Okay. Families have that opportunity to really think, um, even, you know, and, and be expected to maybe spend a week just if they're out together thinking about areas in the community that they would like to do service. Yeah. That, when, that's, when that power mm -hmm. is given to them to decide, um, they should get excited about what they can really do. And that's kind of. So it just may be I haven't seen that because we've just started on the um, whole, you know, family service learning and discussing ideas. So it may be if as people come back, you know, we as that there may be more of an igniting, you know, mm -hmm. which which makes sense. I think likely. And I, yeah. I'll stop talking for just a second and see if any other callers on the phone um, are also if any other ideas to share with you about that. Oh, okay, great. Andrea? Yes. I have a quick question for you, though. Um, is it uh, possible because um, there are some projects in which the families feel very strongly about uh, that have already been placed um, have already been, you know, put together, but they want to be part of, you know, the project and, you know, just kind of like putting more into it. Are they able to loop into these uh, programs? Have discussed that. The, 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 the parents are the ones that are investigating and doing that planning and, and preparation. So if the parents are wanting to um, join to an existing effort, um, they should really be the ones that are seeking out who to contact and how they can get involved. Um, you know, I think that's something we can discuss with, with your technical assistance as well. Um, but the, the parents are going through, through the process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so it would be, um, Almost by case basis, I would say it would be something that we want to discuss um, with equal assistant, but uh, it's definitely a possibility. We just need to make sure that um, that the families are getting the full experience out of it. Okay. And I would say also to that, um, if families are wanting to loop into existing programs, um, that might be considered as like their first service learning project, then really kind of after that, um, you know, a, a family may decide that they want to continue working with one project, and that's awesome and great, and we want to encourage that. But as far as families understanding um, the importance of really developing full projects together as a family, um, I would say also encourage them to to create separate projects as well. 
They're looking at families uh, completing three family service learning projects per year. Um, probably we would not be looking for them to just loop into existing projects for all three of those. Yes, I can I, I can understand, you know, um, where you're coming from. But uh, like you said, it's the first time, you know, project, so they get the the experience in working with, you know, take initiative and um, being able to see, you know, and get comfortable. You know, I, I saw that, you know, that this would be uh, an opportunity uh, for them to look, you know, as their first project. And obviously, once they get comfortable and they see after the debriefing part, you know, what took effect, what could have been different, how can we make it different, how can we get better, you know, and then, you know, like a starting point, you know, I guess that that would be advantage to me of them looping into a project because then they're starting to see, you know, okay, so this is what, you know, this is what they mean, okay. Uh, one thing is telling them and one thing is experimenting on your own and, you know, taking ownership of that, you know, um, project. Yeah, uh, but thank you. That answers my question. Okay. Questions about family service learning? Okay. Would somebody coming in? Okay. Family mentoring. Um, I'm not even going to read you this entire uh, definition here, but when we're looking at family mentoring, we're really looking at kind of very specific different types of mentoring. Um, formal and informal mentoring is really kind of the biggest um, hurdle that we've faced so far with Toyota Family Learning. And um, basically what we look at there is that families are already for informally mentoring each other. They're already seeking each other out. When they, when they see that someone is doing a really great job at something, that they have these assets, They'll go to that family. Well, how do you do that? How could we do that? Um, if this is, you know, if one parent misses parent time, parent will often catch them up, and that's great. And we want to see that happening. I've been documented with the family mentoring logs, but we also want to intentionally create an environment and nurture that environment and relationships for formal mentoring to be happening. Formal mentoring is when two families would be actually matched up and um, meet on a regular basis to help each other out. Uh, some programs have decided to approach this as, um, instead of saying kind of mentor-mentee, to look at this as almost more of partner families, um, because they are both getting something out of the opportunity. And you see that when you look at the family mentoring logs with Andrea, that um, it's, we don't have a separate log for a mentor family versus a mentee family. We need to see what families are learning when they're working together. And um, if you're in cohort one, you already have set a goal and are working toward that for establishing formal mentoring matches. If you're in cohort two, um, you should definitely expect that conversation pretty soon on a technical assistance call uh, to start looking toward setting goals and um, thinking about how to train families to, um, to really be able to engage with one another and share the things that they know and can do well. Um, so really we're looking at that to be one fit to one family. Um, there are other types just from the literature, group mentoring and e-mentoring. Um, it would be something that you want to look into depending on the technological capacity of families you're working with. But um, group touring, we're not considering that as much of family mentoring. So family mentoring, really you're looking to have two families that are matched who will meet on a repeating basis um, so, that it's, so that they're starting to get to know each other um, to a pretty significant level. Um, looking at touring, there are some 
some best practices that uh, we certainly recommend. Um, a mentor relationship would be based on mentee goals, or I then would advocate really looking at both families because um, it doesn't matter what the which it is. Both families will have goals that they want to reach, and so um, it's important to help them kind of realize how they can use this connection with the other family to reach the goals that they're setting. Um, and security and confidentiality are very big um, concerns when you're looking at family mentoring. Um, and this is why it's so important that family mentoring uh, begins with a sums of the training component for families. Um, looking at safety and security, you know, you have two families who are working together. Uh, sometimes it's easy to want to give their family a ride or um, meet at one family or the other family's home. Um, as a best practice, you would really want to discourage things like that. It's best to have a place available that families can meet and uh, work together and know that um, someone else is around and they're not just um, alone with the other family. As the relationships develop, they may get a little more comfortable to meet off-site. Um, reality is also uh, certainly important to teach to anticipating families. If you're in a position of, of just encouraging informal mentoring, um, we certainly want to address these best practices as part of parent time as you're kind of continually throughout uh, showing families how to do uh, family mentoring. But confidentiality is really important because um, family may share any type of information with the other family. Um, that also would lead to making sure that families understand if um, if someone shares something that's illegal or life-threatening, they would uh, want to come to program staff about that. Uh, as we look through the best practices, this really does all come down to training and support for those families. Um, it certainly would not be a wide programmatic move to match two families up and say, kind of, here you go, go for it. So you start out with, um, with a strong training of, a, I would say at least a couple of hours, and support in an ongoing way is going to be critical to the success of family mentoring. Um, different programs handle this in different ways, but um, I know uh, one organization said that their um, their plan in moving into formal mentoring matters is to actually have a check-in with program staff after uh, a month of training and then periodically, so regularly, throughout the rest of the program year. Um, you could do that as essentially a case manager type approach, and um, that really would be beneficial, even if it's a very short meeting uh, after parent time, or uh, even a survey that families can fill out just to let you know that they're still meeting with the other family and if things are going okay or if there's support that they need. Um, but it's definitely important to check in with them to make sure they're getting what they want and what they need out of the experience and to make sure that everything's going okay. Um, in looking at family mentoring, um, is a Family Mentor Facilitator Guide available? It's actually being updated right now, but um, we will change it out until it's complete. Um, the Mentor Guide is based on examples from existing programs. It has uh, some resources to help match families, as I mentioned, with the strength survey, um, to help families really think about what is it that I already know? What is it I would like to, to be stronger at? And um, so the resources are available. The reason it's being updated is that those resources are not in Spanish in the guide yet, but they will be very soon. Um, but just to show you where to locate that, it is a wiki page. And guide uh, kind of under that 
slide. Um, also, since I'm on this slide and I know that I have a couple of people from Erie, I will point out that they just had a fantastic kickoff event for family mentoring, and there's an article link uh, in the discussion that you could check out. So family mentoring is, we acknowledge, a, a pretty challenging cornerstone to implement, but um, it really is, is of all in the eye of the beholder and uh, how you approach that. So definitely something that you, um, especially Cohort 2 folks, that you want to have ongoing conversations with your technical assistant about uh, setting up trainings for family and make sure that they're supported throughout the process. Family mentoring. <laughs> okay. Um, definitely, that is Toyota family learning. Now we're going to look kind of briefly at some of the um, the medical aspects that are not as um, not necessarily programmatic, but they're necessary to uh, support the program. So, looking at the budget, um, of course, with any grant, uh, sites are expected to keep accurate records of their grants uh, and what is done with the fund. When um, we're looking at the budget. Um, those have all been submitted for this year. Uh, I know everyone's approved, and so um, you should see the grant payments play out as um, as you hear. Any questions about that, you would direct to Josh Kramer. Um, the budget submissions, uh, as I said, I know everyone submitted their initial budget with the signed agreement. Um, just to kind of give a heads up, and you'll definitely receive an email uh, closer to the end of the program year. But at the end of the program year, each uh, organization submits a projection for their coming budget year. Um, include any carryover. Uh, any carryover that you anticipate, you would want to discuss with Josh. And then the budget summary um, is due no later than August 1st of the program year. And um, I know it's going to be very important to include any in-kind um, contributions that were made, any grants that were received to help fund Toyota Family Learning. Um, so just to help you make sure that that's all together before you get to that point in the year. Um, an email to, to remind you that that's upcoming. Uh, the part contractually, if there is a change in any budget category of 10% or more, uh, you would need to check with Josh before uh, making that change. And as I said, uh, you would want to get any permission from him for carryovers um, the next budget year. Are there any questions? Great. That saves me saying you need to check with Josh. <laughs> so um, I'll move on and let Andrea talk about evaluation tools. And I will also mention before she starts that Sarah Wilson Toso uh, joined us on the call today also, and she is our independent evaluator. So um, it's very often that just as with budgets, I would say check with Josh. Uh, if it's an evaluation question, often I'll say uh, can you check with Blair about that. So um, we're glad that she's able to join us and may chime in at some point um, if she has extra thoughts for you. Okay. Oh, sorry, do you have a question? Okay. Here we have just outlined um, all of the evaluation tools that are available in your evaluation manual, which we will look at in just a minute. Um, the initial family interview should be conducted one-on-one -on -one with each family within two weeks of their start in the program. Um, home activity learning logs will be completed by each family once a week. So when I talked earlier about how it's important to help parents document what they're doing, um, this is part of the reason why. 
so that when they come back to complete these logs that they uh, have some record of, of what all they did with their children. The mentoring logs will be completed by the mentor and mentee families after their mentoring meetings. So as Patricia mentioned earlier, there are not um, separate logs for those. Um, they will be completing um, the same log. We'll look at that in just a minute. The thing reflection logs will be completed as a group following each project. And then the interview uh, will be conducted one-on-one -on -one with each family at the end of the program. So we're going to go through the entire evaluation manual, but I do want to just point out where it's located uh, on the wiki space and also point out a couple of the resources there. Before I switch the screen, I, I just wanted to mention also, with family mentoring logs, those can absolutely be introduced to families and completed as informal mentoring is happening as well. Um, and, be, and with the family service learning reflection logs, um, it's perfectly, and that is the group log, it's perfectly fine for the parent facilitator to, um, to actually complete the log with families. It doesn't have to be a family actually sitting at the computer doing it. WikiSpace, under the Evaluation tab, you'll see all of the evaluation manuals are listed here. Um, there's one per site that you can download. So we'll just look at one as an example. Um, this really has all of the information that you will need for evaluation. Um, the calendar, um, as you go through this, outlines the timeline uh, of what things should be submitted. And there will also be links to each of to each of the logs. Um, go through. Um, there's the links to the actual survey gizmo where you'll complete uh, the survey. And uh, this is what it looks like. And if you're looking for the Spanish translation, you can click that, the bar at the top, uh, and, and have it translated for you. Uh, the manual, you'll be able to see, uh, like I said, all of those. There are also um, codes that can be scanned as you're going through. Um, and I just want to point out, if some of you all are doing these on iPads, uh, there is a Survey Gizmo app that is available for the iPad. So if families are completing these that way, um, there's an app that you can download so that they can access these um, that way as well. Are there about the annual? I just want to point out um, when we're looking at consent forms, many of you have already started, um, so these should be completed. But um, there are links at the bottom of this um, for the uh, photo lease form and the family consent form. So where it says 2014-15 photo release form, um, that's actually the link to, um, to that form. And below that is the link to the uh, family consent form. So there are actually two forms there. Um, I got it was a little confusing before. And Spanish are available right there. All right, evaluation tools. Okay, the expectations, um, as we said before, two hours per week for parent time. Also a minimum of two hours per week for pack time. It's expected that each family will complete three learning projects. They threw, so three per family. Entering goals that have been set for your uh, organization will be reached. So, as Patricia said earlier, um, there are already set for cohort one, cohort two. We will be having those discussions um, very soon. And at least five families completing programming within the three years. Here, did you add? Yes. 
very quick question for you. I noticed that the, it's a three family service learning projects per family. Now, is it all where they, all the families can join together for one, uh, the purpose of one uh, project? They get individual, um, and like it was their own and the project, so they're all joining force. They're all including their families, but it's one, one, one project or one event, one service. Yes. Is that possible? Okay. Just one. That is possible. possible. It's also possible that one family might seek out their own project and complete right. one on their own or with a smaller group of families. So it can happen uh, in, in different ways, but each family needs to participate in three okay. learning projects. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's typically likely that your first project at the very least would multiple families or all of your families together. At point, that's when they're learning the process. That's when um, program staff would be modeling good reflection and uh, really helping parents to infuse learning into what they're doing. Um, later, though, it, you know, it might be that families who are doing family mentoring do a project together, or as Andrea said, even just one family really gets ignited about an idea and moves on to that. Okay, and also at communication, um, we have resources available on the wiki space um, to look at folks' families. So, um, you know, occasionally we will have um, opportunities to have um, a media article or something like that where we're looking for uh, a family to highlight. And so it's good to have somebody uh, in mind as we're looking at those. So families that you feel um, would be able to um, to serve as a folks family. So we have included um, a worksheet that some of you I know already have included in your immersions. Um, really to have that information um, just ready uh, on file about your family so that if you're asked to provide that, that you already have that available. Um, Tricia is navigating to that for us. So just a worksheet to just give you an outline of what the family um, the family looks like. Um, you can list the parents. You can have them fill this out. Um, so you have that background information. You can also include a picture. Um, so that is available for you. For you there. I know. And, also, um, sorry. Sorry. Um, notice that as we um, we were using these in, a, in our own uh, immersions, um, a lot of families kept asking, so who we are, what do you, what do you mean who we are? Who we are as a family, who we are as an individual? I mean, it, it wasn't very clear, and that's what they, you know, that particular, you know, about. Can you really? Emily? And, and that's kind of open to interpretation, either based on what the family wants to do or what you as a site want to um, want to ask of them. Um, that would be including information about where they're from, um, it could be what they like to do on the weekends, um, how they view themselves as a family. That's, that, that was my best explanation, how do they view themselves as a family. And even like that, I mean, they have they had quite some difficulty trying to do them, you know, how. So, okay, that answers the question. Thank you. And on uh, getting families started with things like this, that's where you start to see that um, it is a little uncomfortable sometimes because they're not sure, well, how do we see ourselves? And so that's kind of part of the beginning for families is to start really looking at themselves and and, um, and where they want to go. Um, one of the things that I love about working with Toyota Family Learning is that really it's it's very family directed and so they get to decide where they want to go with it. So families, sorry I had started to say this, with families 
Um, it's a good idea to make sure that you have their contact information readily available because um, I know most of you are with cohort two, so uh, this will be a new experience with you. But um, it may be that your technical assistance uh, coach or that someone else from NCFL calls you and says, as, you know, as Andrea said, well, we have who's interested in doing a story about the program in your area, and they'd like to be in touch with a family today. And so if that's the case, it's really good to make sure the families understand if they're, if they're going to be a spokes family, that someone may contact them and to make sure that you have their contact information available um, because we, it's easier to prepare this ahead of time and know that that may happen than to have one of us call you that day and say, we'd really, really like to make this story happen, but, you know, we have to, um, we have to contact them quickly. Um, it's, it's very important to make sure that all the consent forms are completed uh, at the very beginning so that you have those on file for when those situations come up um, so that they have those, you have them on file, or we have them on file. Uh, we've let um, every site submit one item of media interest per quarter, so this would be um, you know, event or something that's going on that we would be able to highlight uh, in the media, and we need to know about those before they happen. Uh, so we're asking you to plan ahead and really think about what's happening in your organizations and communicate with us, um, communicate that information to us um, by deadlines that are on here. Um, and we'll go to the calendar in just a minute, but you'll see there are different uh, dates on there for cohort one and cohort two. Um, so by those dates, we ask that you have, um, you know, some item of interest. If you have something that's happening before those dates, absolutely um, send that to us. But we really uh, need to know about those in advance so that we can uh, get everything lined up to make sure that we're highlighting that uh, appropriately. And a good example for this is um, the story that I showed you from Deary earlier. Uh, that was one that they submitted to us, and actually they reached out to their local media uh, as far as sharing the story. But as we knew about it early enough, um, we were able to craft a blog post from NFL as well as to tweet out and share that on Facebook. Um, and also they communicated back and forth with our communications department. Uh, to get additional information that, to add to the story um, as they were working with local media. So, see, uh, we have a, an improved calendar on the resources tab. There's one per cohort. So when you have um, a media deadline, all of that information is on calendar already. So when we're here at the Cohort 2 calendar, they have an opportunity um, submission to do on the 7th. So if you click on the link, uh, it gives you several options. Um, first, there's a link to complete the actual survey. So you go right into the calendar, um, click on survey, and all that information that we need uh, will pop up so that you can just fill it out right there uh, electronically. There are options that you can add these dates to your own calendar. So you can click on copy to my calendar. It will give you the option to copy it to a Google Calendar or an Outlook Calendar to go through. I'll the calendar here. I'll just point out that uh, Cohort 2, your technical assistance visits will be uh, in the January or February time frame. Uh, there is kind of, this is showing kind of the beginning of that time period, but your technical assistance coach will coordinate with you as an individual site to, uh, to set the best date for that. So it, it may not necessarily fall in that exact week. Okay. Are there any questions about communication or anything else that we have discussed today? Uh, 
Um, one more question about um, like blending pay time and pack time. Now, I see how it would be when you're working on like a family um, lear you know, learning project or something. But um, I think Jennifer was mentioning my manager that she had talked to someone that um, a lot of uh, I see a pack time together as a group. Did it, I think it sounded like it was through uh, uh, maybe maybe it was through the um, service learning, but it, like I don't know if it was like maybe taking field trips or going to like a museum or, or I mean is that is that um, is there anything you can say any more about you know having a little bit more flexible. Time we're overlapping some parent time and pack time. I think what you're asking, I think the answer is yes. Okay. Um, the expectation is still that there would be two hours a week of parent time and two hours a week of pack time. Okay. Um, but if you're doing something like a field trip, it means that there is. Um, parent parent time that's leading up to that, and then families would actually go together. Um, okay. Maybe while parents are in parent time, children are doing something that's kind of activating uh, ideas about where the future yeah. is going that, to go. That's, I think, what they were saying. That makes sense. It just and sounded then, interesting. Yeah, and it kind of bookend that then with having, you know, upon return from the field trip, having a um, for okay. Doing oh, okay. That sounds good. Yeah, that's helpful. Any other? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. Um, for the mentoring, uh, the family mentoring logs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just like the family service has three per family, is it like a, a a number that we need to have for me, uh, family mentoring, or is it just one per family? Sharing is going to be more um, a visual organization conversation with your technical assistance coach um, because I guess, let me start with, with this. We would love to see as much mentoring as possible happening. So um, if that is informal mentoring at the present moment, then um, absolutely as much as possible. Looking at specific numbers of matches, uh, mentoring is something that um, needs to be handled in a, and, and approached in a very careful way um, to ensure that families are not put in uh, situations that are not okay for them to be put in, but also that they're re receiving the support that's necessary to get benefits from, from that engagement. And so to make sure that we're not just saying every family must be in a formal mentoring relationship, that will work with your technical assistance coach um, to create a goal for how many families. Okay. Nope. Any others? Um, I'll give you just a second after I finish. It sounds like somebody might be talking a little. Um, just a reminder while I still have you here, uh, we do have an evaluation webinar with our independent evaluator, Claire Wilson Toso, tomorrow. So if you look on the Cohort 2 calendar or Cohort 1, if you're Cohort 1, um, you'll actually see that, uh, that listed. and. Um, I think can, yeah, it already has the information there. So if you did not receive an email telling you how to log into that webinar, the information is um, attached in the note here. Um, just to clarify on the on the logs, the family service learning log is one log per project. That's not one log per family. So if you're a cohort one group, uh, you may be well known as a group last year too.
to. But to make sure everyone understands, that would be where um, really uh, it could be as part of reflection even, that families are sitting down together at the end of a project and completing that together. So there, don't, there do not need to be um, 20 different logs for one project. Any other? Yeah. We have four schools that we are working with, and so far we have two of um, the many services that are going to be done. Um, we just do one per site. But with the other two, if they have not been uh, confirmed with the date and stuff, I mean, is there like a, a date where these have to be turned in? No, the specific date, there just needs to be three per family um, okay. throughout the program. So if two sites have done it, you would just submit one per project. Per project. So each of those would have one log, and then when the other sites complete their projects, they would finish their logs. Okay. I just want to know if there was a specific Project one or a family service, one has to be done by this date. So as long as they're done, you know, overall and within the year. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I've recorded um, this webinar, so it will be available. Uh, on the wiki space, as we are finished. Um, we all ha are offering another webinar on Tuesday. So if you had anyone who would like to participate, um, that information is on the calendar as Patricia is showing us right now. Um, so you can access that um, that one. So we'll hang on for just another minute, but um, thank you all for your time today. And if you think of any other questions, um, please feel free to contact your technical assistant um, after this. Mon that has a question.